We have Tim Krohn, mm -hmm. who was also born in Germany, but grew up in Switzerland and is based in Zurich, um, a city of expats, I've heard. <laughs> 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 he writes novels, short stories, as well as theater and radio plays. Among the latter one was the promising title, The Apocalyptic Show of the Four Rivers of Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> he was not th yet 30 when, uh, in 1993, he received the UNDA Radio Prize for a radio play about racism, followed a year later by the prestigious Konrad Ferdinand Meyer Prize. His book, Friendly's Gartley, Friendly's, uh, Friendly's Little Garden, was honored with the lit Literaturperle 2007, the Literary Pearl of 2007. He has also written film scripts, and according to his website, several are in progress. He also mentions on, in that said website, curiosities, which can be anything from children's books to political essays, and one learns that he has been reading to guests in their rooms at bedtime at, the, at a hotel in Wals. <laughs> this year he will direct a play at the World Theater in Einsiedeln with hundreds of Swiss citizens. Mm -hmm. To the Sea, the book that uh, we chose, centers around two heroines, Josefa and Anna, who were inseparable as children and teenagers until the supposed suicide of one of the girls drives them apart. Uh, girl, girl's mother drives them apart. The book is a journey into their past and tells the story of healing the wounds of the past, but only to a degree. It is also very much a book about how little we know about ourselves, our lives, the people around us, and how blind we, we move through our lives. <coughs> <coughs> so this part uh, I'm reading is about Josefa when she's 17 and her best friend Anna, who was supposed to be there too, but she isn't, and the parents of Josefa. Uh, I will start and Andrew will continue. Lars, ich rede mit dir, sagte Margot anstatt ihr zu antworten. Sie fixierte ihn mit einem Blick, der mehr Verzweiflung als Wut zeigte. »Und ich rede mit euch«, rief Joe entgeistert dazwischen. »Hallo, ich will wissen, ob ihr Anna gesehen habt.« »Nachher, Joe«, sagte Lars in einem Tonfall, als sei sie nichts weiter als ein kleines, quengelndes Mädchen. Dann reinigte er weiter seine Muscheln. »Hörst du nicht, geh schon«, wiederholte er, als sie sich nicht gleich rührte und warf ihr einen flüchtigen Blick zu. Joe verlor die Fassung. »Ich wollte schließlich nur wissen, wo Anna steckt«, brüllte sie ihn an, dann wandte sie sich ab und donnerte die Tür ins Schloss. Während sie wütend ins Freie stapfte, begriff sie, dass Anna wie sie in den Streit geraten sein musste und sich daraufhin verkrümelt hatte. Das war auch sicherlich das Vernünftigste. Sie beschloss, die Florian klar zu machen und staunte nicht schlecht, als sie die Jolle unverteut und mit nur halb geborgenen Segeln im Kabelwasser treiben sah. »Wer hat die Florian nicht festgemacht?« brüllte sie zum Haus zurück. »Seid ihr jetzt völlig verrückt geworden?« Gleich wartete sie hinaus, das Wasser war kälter, als sie erwartet hatte. Der auflandige Wind schien über Nacht die wärmeren Schichten aus der Bucht gedrängt zu haben, um die Jolle festzumachen und die Segel zu bergen. Eine Leine war abgewetzt und sollte schon länger ersetzt werden. Sie nestelte sie eben aus den Ösen, als sie Margots Stimme hörte. Im nächsten Moment kam sie hinab zur Bucht. Sie schien inzwischen nur noch erschöpft zu sein. Einige Minuten lang stand sie direkt neben der Florian und starrte aufs Meer hinaus. Doch noch immer gab es kein Anzeichen, dass sie ihre Tochter bemerkt hätte. You usually never fight, Joe said, when she couldn't bear the silence any longer and noticed for the first time that she was crying. She irritably wiped her face with the back of her hand. Her mother still didn't answer. Only when Joe asked, Are you going to get divorced? Did Margot show any reaction. Nonsense, she said without turning her head. Sunlight glittered blindingly on the waves. Margot was squinting in the light, and she grabbed her forehead again, briefly before saying, I'm going for a swim. The water's freezing, Joe said. It's not even 50 degrees. But Margot was already wading out into the water. She didn't seem to feel the cold. I'm coming with you, Joe shouted after her. Just give me a second to replace the line. She ran to the garage to get a new one. 
Her father, in the meantime, had begun loading several pieces of restored furniture into the SUV. Leave the boat for now, he said. We'll do it when I get back. Suddenly, everything seemed to be as it was before. Joe only needed to exchange a few words with Lars, something about the regatta or the wind, and she would be Daddy's little girl again, and it would be one of those Saturdays she so loved. But it didn't work out that way. She didn't say a word. She couldn't even force herself to look at him. She silently picked up the line and returned to the skiff. Joe, Lars called after her. Josepha! But she paid no attention to him. Margot had swum out quite a distance. The mist and the sunlight's reflection on the waves made her silhouette hazy, hiding her completely at times. Joe threaded the new line into the grommets, wound up the old one, then hopped over the side into the water, barely knee-deep at that spot, and weighed it out. She paused after a few steps to get used to the cold and look for her mother. Joe was astonished to realize that she had lost sight of her. She was certain that the light was playing tricks on her, or that her mother had simply ducked underwater and would soon be visible again. Joe felt her calves stiffen in the icy water and the cold drain the feelings from her legs. At that temperature, you cannot stay under for long. Joe concluded that the reflections on the water were not hiding her mother. The boats out on the bay disappeared only briefly in the glittering waves. Margot, however, did not resurface at all. <laughs>